and go. You do actually want to delete as many uh, of these faces as you can because in the next stage you will see that we are actually going to render a texture and the texture is going to obviously have a set resolution um, because you don't want to use infinite texture resolution to render all of these faces properly. So the fewer faces you actually have to render, the better of this will go. And so it is a great life choice to minimize the amount of um, items that you actually have to um, to render, like the back of this gravity well. And this. It was a little difficult seeing what the exact cutoff point is. I'm going to guess it is here. And it's possibly over there. I know I could have prepared this all up front, but um, I'm also still working on this object. So um, since the request for the tutorial just happened a few minutes ago, I figured I'd just record myself doing this and then you will be able to see it when it's done. Let's see. See, as you can see, these small objects here are still illuminated, even though you may not want um, the entire thing, which is understandable. You can still, uh, of course, cut away these objects. You only really need the, need the very, very illuminated parts, such as this and the trench and um, all these other things. You don't really need very light objects like I'm sure there are so, there are a few faces on the sides of this that I can throw away this whole roster here probably can go yeah let's actually see how much of that can go hmm maybe 3ds has a function to automatically do this but if that exists, I don't know about it. Okay. Are there any other major faces that we can simply delete? Yeah, these are the... Maybe true. Maybe. We can delete this, which is on the inside. Maybe there are more. No, this is just the top. And everything else has already been optimized via this. Let's see, anything else? We could delete all of this since this is barely visible. Which is all of this. Minus, of course, everything here. How's this? As I said, this we can simply delete because it is not visible or not visible enough. Okay, so now what we are going to do is we are going to flat map this entire object, unwrap UVW. Uh, as you can see, the UV is a gargantuan mess because we have attached a whole bunch of objects to a single mesh and are then trying to use it. So what we are going to do is we're going to go to map flat map. We're going to set the spacing to this angle to one normalized clusters. Oh, actually normalized clusters should have been on my bad. Um, normalized clusters on and that should give us a somewhat optimized UV. Yeah, see this is this is this is pretty bad because there's a lot of wasted space. Now you could of course spend a whole bunch of time manually fixing the UVW. Okay. Turn rotate clusters off. What are we going to get? That's far worse. Turn fill holes off. That's generally also a bad idea, but I figured we'll try. Okay, I'm going to try once more. It takes like three seconds to do this at time, so it's easy to justify spending a little bit of time finding the correct settings. Okay, well, this is apparently what we are going with. This is uh, map channel 1. Convert back to editable poly. And then we are going to go to the actual magic. Um, we'll go to rendering. And then somewhere here should be, 
if I recall correctly, it has been a while since I've done this, render the texture. Now this screen, you can do a lot wrong on this screen. You can actually do a whole lot wrong on this entire, in this entire setup um, that causes the omnis that you have set to not actually render the texture that you have set onto your material. We want to not render the texture of the material because if we want to keep the texture intact and if we want to do that via um, a resolution that is actually still recognizable as the original texture, once it is exported as a light map, which this will have to be exported as, um, because sadly Empire at War does not use um, actual volumetric lighting of course, um, you're going to require such a texture resolution um, or so many maps of this light that it's simply not viable for the game because you will start getting like two, three, four, five texture maps. So we want just a plain, just a plain material. That's also easiest to set up. Um, so we have already UV'd our new object here. And as, as I said, there's probably many more faces that you can manually delete, but this is just, this is just for show. Okay, so from the top uh, to the bottom, we're going to go through this. We have the object selected hull, which is this. Hull enabled padding to, uh, don't need to change that. Project mapping, I don't entirely recall what this was. Mapping coordinates, we want to keep the existing channel because we have already manually uh, unwrapped the UVW using the flat map. Like so, this is um, map channel 1 as we have just determined, so we want to map it according to channel 1. If you are actually doing this with a texture, um, on a ship that, for example, does is not so gargantuan as this, and you are doing it for a Corvette, for example, uh, you can actually use the original texture of the ship for the lights, and it will look as if it is not illuminating just a green, empty uh, th thing, but it will look as if it's actually illuminating the texture of the ship, which will look better, and in which case you will need to start messing around with the uh, UV channels once you have everything connected to one object. As I said, this is that is beyond the scope of this one tutorial, and we are simply going to cover the basics of how to do this um, as efficiently as possible without draining too much of the game's resources, since a lot of the people that um, I know are going to be using this already have ships with so many texture sets that they really want the optimized version. So we're going to use channel one. We are going to already uh, use existing channel. We don't want automatic UV on the app. We already have our UV because of the flat map. Now this is the set where you actually, um, what it's actually going to be rendering. So we click add and I think it is complete map. You can also use light map or diffuse map. We're going to simply make a complete map because that's the whole thing. That's everything that's illuminated. Um, I'm very, very happy with the texture sets of my Eclipse. It uses a single 2K map for the armor and then a 1 1K map for the superstructure. No, it's not even 1K. It's actually uh, simply 500 by 500. And then a few very, very small textures like um, uh, the hangers, which are all to 250 by 250. So I think for the lighting mesh, we can we can go a little bit larger. We're going to go to 1K. Uh, diffuse color, I think that's how we do it. The TGA, yeah, let's let's render it as TGA first and then see what we're getting. Um, output into source, save source, let's do that. Hmm... Don't remember, this is all the automatic unwrapping stuff. We don't need this. This is basically flat mapping anyway, but we just decided to manually do it. A little more control that way. Automatic map size. Uh, okay, so it does it automatically. Well, we want to set it manually for this resolution. Okay, so let's see. Now if we press render, we should... Okay, so as you can see here, this is not ideal and this is not all that great because of course you're limited by your texture resolution uh, we're going to save this anyway um, let's put that in downloads and oh right it already saved the complete map okay so as you can see here um, 
Oh, right. It disabled the... It automatically merged this material with the new map, so we simply set this back in order to get the original back, which is just the uh, default material untextured um, thing. If we now delete every Omni and just have our object and we actually attach our whole map into the uh, diffuse uh, we don't need to do that we can simply load that from here whole map complete we load this back into the diffuse map we apply it to this object and then of course we set it to this you can now see what this is actually going to look like in game at least that should be what this does. Let's see. Does this have any resolution? Um, does this even have any resolution changes? Because I remember it looking better than this in the actual render. Ah, yes. 3DS always has a... Uh, has a fun time with textures. Um, let's see if we can actually get the texture resolution up a little bit. Background, save frame. I actually forgot what that was. Hmm. Okay, so it might actually be improve. Does that do it? No. Okay, so never mind. Um. This is, of course, nonsense, because our texture does have a better quality than this. Namely, if you look at this, you can actually see the texture that we have rendered. And as you can see, there is a lot of black. You, of course, want as little black as you can get. Um, you can still see the artifacting right over here. You can still see the layers. Once you export this to DDS, this is going to become much, much worse. So ideally for these smaller lights. I mean, it's not as bad as that you can see here, at least I hope not. Three S Max normally also impacts the um, the texture quality, so that's why I don't trust what I'm seeing in this viewport right now. Uh, since it should be better than this, I think 3DS simply cuts it off uh, sooner. Let's see, it still has the UV, right? Yes, it does. So why is it fucking up? Hmm. Okay, so for demonstration purposes, we are going to render our object again. We simply undo, which is Control Z, or under edit the undo button until we have our original object back. That's our object. Then very shortly, our Omnis will follow right over here and our Objects would still have the default material. If not, we can simply grab one from the material editor, set it to the object, and then render the texture again, this time with a high resolution, namely 2K, and we go. Overwrite file, don't show this message again. And now we have a high resolution texture. Now, remember what I said about um, the texture resolution and how this isn't actually a very efficient uh, way of work? This is actually the most efficient way to do this, at least that I know of. Um, and the only thing you can do to further improve upon this is, let's see, we can, this is already automatically baked into the material, so this is what we should see. That's still not great, isn't it? Still not great. Then again, 3DS may be affecting the texture quality. I'm not sure, it, it has done this for me and with, uh, with, with varying results. With varying results, let's just say. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. How much faith do we put into this object right now? Well, nothing, because as you can see, the texture is clearly affecting 3ds Max since this cutoff point is way, way stronger than what you can actually see here. Um, but this is basically the gist of it. What you do now is you save this as a uh, DDS texture, which, as I said, it will actually severely impact the quality, which if I now load up the DDS texture, you will see. Of course, if you were able to... Oh, did it automatically export? That's unfortunate. I just wanted the DDS. Of course, if we were able to use the DDS encode for DX10 and 
a 9, which is Mm. Yeah, BC3. This is uh, simply DirectX 9. If we could encode the textures for Empire at War with DirectX 10 or 11, it will be nearly lossless, but sadly this is DirectX 9 and there is a severe artifacting issue, which is what you can see here. And of course you do not want to see this on your, um, your in-game model, so this is probably not going to look too great. Um, there's no real way to stop the artifacting. The, you can, of course, fix the base texture by simply increasing the texture resolution for the bake itself. And this may be a poor example since there are so many omnis to render and this object is quite large. Again, as you delete um, space on the UV, you get more resolution for the area you want to actually bake. And the quality will improve, even though the artifacting of the DDS export will eventually um, screw you over. Anyway, what you can do is instead of saving it as a DDS, you keep it as a TGA. Um, but the there is a significant difference in size. For example, the DDS texture is 4K and the TG... I don't believe that. I don't trust this. Not one bit. The TGA encode is of course much much um, more intensive or size intensive than DDS. So every time you see a TGA which is smaller than a DDS then um, you should of course be very very um, suspicious of things. Like here if you now export this as a TGA this is nearly f this is more than four times as big as the actual DDS texture. I do wonder that if you use the actual whole complete map, um, if we go to Photoshop, again I know I just closed it, but I want to see what the, di what the difference is between these two files that makes this so much larger. Because if you magically can actually use this one instead of having to export to DDS, that would of course be amazing. And I am finding that out right now. RGB 8, RGB 8, it both has an alpha channel. I really wonder where the difference in quality is, or the difference in encode. Is it maybe that it's exported differently? I mean, this one was exported with a 32-bit color, but then it I'm not sure. I'm going to try this out, ladies and gentlemen. If you can, um, once you have your um, your your complete color map exported from 3ds Max, which as I showed you is uh, right here, and it says it as a TGA texture, you should always attempt to export it to DDS regardless to see if it if if it is actually smaller. If it is not, like in this case, I recommend actually trying to use this one, which is what I'm definitely going to be doing on my uh, ship. Because if you can get a smaller file size for more quality, well then that's really a no-brainer, you should do that. Um, okay, so then on to the next phase of the, the experiment, because obviously we're not done. You now have an object which is... Um, texture separately, you have a new texture for it, and now you want to actually use it on your ship. Are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we I want part of my my entire ship back, which I have saved somewhere. Here. Um, sure. Yep, whole thing except you. You're not needed. Uh, yeah, auto rename. Okay, so right now the 3ds Max is loading the ship, which will take a few seconds. Okay, I hope the recording still worked. Um, our issue now is that we have our mesh, our lights mesh, on top of the actual, well, ship mesh. That's a problem. We want it to be slightly apart or uh, on top of it. So what we can do, there are two modifiers which are useful for this. One is push, one is shell. I will show you both. Uh, push is generally more useful, at least in these situations, than shell. At least I find. I will show you. As I said, both. The push 
will allow you to simply push the faces away from each other, which can have some fairly disastrous consequences if you try to apply this to complex geometry, such as this. You um, get situations where the program does not know where to push the vertexes, and so objects that were once flat, like the armor plating, are now no longer flat because via the algorithm it, uh, it did it incorrectly. It's still generally easier than to, um, for example, manually select the faces and then move them up. Um, but as I said, if you use this method, you do generally have to do some fixing, which um, you simply convert back to editable poly. And if you want to be really uh, quick and lazy about it, you simply select the thing and then you hit make planar to make the whole thing planar again. It will alter the rotation of your face. So in this case, we would have to um, rotate it. No, not that way. This way very slightly. And that just takes a bunch of time, as I said. Sometimes... In very special cases, it is actually easier to manually move the faces. So instead of using push, you simply select your face and then you simply move it up slightly or just away from the other face. Generally, in this game, I have found that the if you're using a scale factor of um, one on your models, um, the best distance from the face is point. 0.15 so it is zero it's about here 15 if you are going with large objects like well this eclipse for example then you can easily go further um, i'd even say go up to 0.3 um, because the further away the face is going to be the um, fuck here the game engine gets rendering it and the further away you need to place your faces in order to prevent artifacting and other such issues such as this flickering that you can see right here which if that happens in game for a light mesh you are fucked so what i actually suggest doing is for gargantuan objects like these just simply put them away much much further like 0.5 even i i personally use 0.5 i show you the shell modifier shell 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 um, works a little differently. It actually keeps the original face intact and it simply creates a pushed object like so, which the outer amount is now set to uh, 1. I said I'd place it to 0 0.5. Now we have 0 0.5. Uh, downside of the... Oh, did that actually work better? Oh, I think it might have. Wow, impressive. Okay, so apparently I was going to say that the shell modifier, I think, uses the same algorithms as the push modifier to actually place the faces away from the original mesh, but apparently that is not the case. Since we do not get the um, flickering and the artifacting that we got and the incorrect vertexes right over here that we got using the push modifier. That's another thing I've learned today, so always use your shell modifier. Um, but of course we only want to keep the outer faces because now it nearly like doubled or tripled the poly count because well you have all these inner um, inner faces. So what we're going to do is we are going to select um, select outer faces, which means that you now only have the faces selected that you actually wanted to push out. Then we are going to go back to convert to editable poly, which is simply right click convert to. Editable poly, we select polygon or simply four on the keyboard as a hotkey. And you now automatically still have all the outer faces selected. We are now going to detach. We call it object one or um, volumetric lights or whatever you want to call it. And we are now left with the original uh, or not with the original. We are now left with all the faces that were uh, created extra like all of this. But all of the actual faces that we wanted are now in our other, other objects. So we can simply delete this and we keep these. And these are now set out um, about 0.5 from the original um, object. Which as you can see here, this was the original object, the ship hull. And this is, this is our object. Okay, so what we have right now is we have... No, that's actually unfortunate. Hang on a second. Let's see. Okay, so that was just an issue with... Right. I for... Yeah. 
These are the volumetric lights. This is the object to delete. Okay, so I forgot one step, which is now going to cause some of these faces to not attach um, to each other. For example, this. This could have been prevented by simply the step where I said put everything into one object, which is where I uh, selected the hull and then attached every other object to it in order to bake our uh, lighting uh, our lighting map. Is what you do is you once you are done attaching everything to one object is you select all the vertexes and you simply weld um, using just a single click which is 0.01 this will attach every vertex um, that was a copy of another which will simply attach every all of those vertexes together which is going to prevent issues like this uh, I could go into detail but just trust me just do this and this will prevent these issues so right now we have your your additional lighting mesh and your additional texture. From now on it's a simple case of in 3ds Max 8. I prefer to do this in 16 before exporting it to 3ds Max 8 to then export it to ALO. From now on it's a simple case of um, attaching the DirectX 9 shader and the mesh editive shader and then load the texture we have simply just rendered. Which as I said try to use the smaller one and if you can use the TGA file that's great because you get the increased quality without the artifacting from the exporting. Um, simply attach it to the mesh and well voila you are done. Of course for specific objects such as a super laser charged particle you of course want to hide this object um, and then unhide it at the moment of um, when the laser actually fires. This is also how my Death Star is set up. Let's load that up for a second. This is exactly how I made this. Um, give you an example. I know the video is kind of dragging for what it's trying to show, but I will quickly show you the effect this can have if done properly. Um, the Death Star is gargantuan. I have to zoom out quite a bit, but we will get there. And here we are, the Death Star Wars, the Super Laser, right about there. If we now activate the fire animation, we now have this very large light mesh that now suddenly became visible. This is just a simple mesh, which is rendered via the same method as this is. Um, I think it uses a 2K texture, I'm not sure. Um, which This is again DDS exported, so you still get this artifacting on the sides, but in general it looks good enough to still use it. Um, I called it ambient. See, you can simply turn it off. Um, I made this appear via the animation, which is simply just setting the visibility to zero and flip that over to one. And then once the animation is over, um, it simply puts it out again, as you can see here. Uh, done properly, this can work for, for example, super lasers. This can work for ambient engine glows. This can work for uh, trench lighting even. Only at that point you really are going into the very very detailed um, part. You, you can basically use it everywhere where you want but remember every face that you illuminate has to be copied and has to be a place on the texture which the more textures you have obviously the um, more resource intensive the ship is going to be and this is going to drastically increase the amount of texture space that your ship is going to require so I really really um, want to encourage you to keep this at the minimum Especially for large ships like this, because um, to keep it looking um, consistently good, you have to use ever-increasing texture resolutions, and the game just does not like those. Um, but yeah, if you keep it to a, to a minimum and use it simply only for, for example, engines and only in the appropriate places, then you can actually get some really nice effects. I will give you another quick example of this done properly, at least I think it was done properly. Um, where, oh, where is it? The Munificent. Oh, wait, the Munificent's actually in several pieces. Uh, let's see. This is actually a good example because the ambient engine glow is actually on a separate, um, a separate object, namely the engines. This is all a ambient engine glow, and this was rendered to the actual texture. The texture of the Munificent is only uh, 500 by 500, which... Um, 
led me to believe that you can um, simply use that texture to render the ambient engine glow, which if I now turn off the actual, let's see, these are the break off, that was the actual object, and for the rest it's all uh, shadow, well, shadow is actually one of the lighting meshes, right. Um, as you can see here, this is all transparent. You can, if I turn on the ground and simply move it down, you can see this is all non-solid. This is all lighting mesh. This is all rendered to texture ambient glow, which really adds something to the finished model. Wish I could show you the intact thing, but um, as I said, it's, it's broken up into several parts. And using it this way can really add a lot to your 3D model um, and may, make it come more alive, so to say. So yeah, that was uh, the tutorial. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a little long-winded, but uh, I hope you learned something from it anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching, and uh, have fun modeling.